Hello, wonderful. It is Sarah K. Ramsey, and I'm here with Sandra L. Brown, M.A., and she is the founder of the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction. She's written three books, um, Counseling Victims of Violence, um, How to Spot a Dangerous Man, which I am in almost at the end of right now, and then Women Who Love Psychopaths. So she has ran a personality disorder clinic um, within the field of psychopathology and is a trauma therapist. So what's really interesting about her and her work is she has worked with both the the bad guys and, and the women who are with them, right? Right. <laughs> hey, Sandra, how are you? Hi. Thank you so much for talking to, to my women and my listeners. Um, Great. I have, I have all these notes. If you see me looking on my phone, I'm not checking my text messages. I've, I've done all these notes uh, from Sandra's work and wanting to make sure I brought out different pieces of her work that were super helpful. Um, Sandra, how long have you been doing this? 30 over 30 years over 30 years who's, who's counting <laughs> <laughs> so if there was i know we're going to speak for about an hour but if there was one thing one phrase one thing from in 30 something years that you had to say oh if i could just give you this one you know sentence two or three sentences what uh, what would you give people um I, I think I would, um, you know, talk about the difficulty and the no change yeah. of personality disorders mm -hmm. in psychopathology. That's why it's called psychopathology. And the thing I think that women get stuck in <clears throat> for a couple reasons, um, it is this desire and uh, desire to continue to work on the relationship and a very fervent belief um, in the human capacity for change, um, which, is true, yes. Yes. which is true for um, lots of people, but the reason yes. personality disorders are called psychopathology, those are the disorders we have no magic wand for. Mm -hmm. oh, and I want to point out a quote from your book. Um, we have to stop creating situations where women's hearts are bigger than their minds. And I love that, you know, you and I are going to get into a discussion about super traits. Um, mm -hmm. The way I say it is your best pieces were used against you. Uh, you call it super traits, but you know, we're, we're saying so much of the same thing here, which is, oh, you know, my love, my heart is bigger than my mind. And it is really hurting really great women, really great women. Exactly. Um, and that's what led sort of the research to find out why their hearts were so big yeah. and why it was so difficult to translate that harm cognitively, mm -hmm. you know, from heart to mind to make those decisions um, to back up. And this is where a lot of these people struggle, which is why we, you know, spent some time researching that. Well, I, I want to get into that research for sure. But, and I want to bring up the question of antennas. I know you said our antenna question would lead into the super traits conversation, but I loved, it just hit me that, that, that idea of our little antennas. And you said so many women, but despite all the the feminist movement, the research around red flags, like, you know, uh, there was a client call I had before this. And I said, if, if I just said you're in a relationship with someone and they say they want to sleep with other people, you would know that was a red flag. Yet when it happened to you, you went around what you call loopholes. You call them loopholes. You found a loophole to make it not that bad in your circumstance. Right. What is happening? Like that, that to me is the problem. We can't change toxic people. We can change that, right? Well, that came out of the Dangerous Man book, which yeah. was before we did the research. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. So we, we sort of answered that question. Um, I called it loopholes then. What we ended up finding out is that that is 
part of their super traits, yeah. but that loopholing is actually cognitive dissonance. I believe you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's what's happening with that. Um, when they can't, you know, hold two differing uh, opinions about him, he's sleeping with other people and I'm not ready for this to end. Um, then the mind begins to create those loopholes. But, you know, after uh, a lot of studying, we figured out that that actually was dissonance. And I want to get into some more explanation of what that is in case people aren't familiar with that. Um, but one of the things that she said in, in this first book uh, is that women have really strong antennas for other women and protecting other women. And then when it comes to themselves, their antennas like shrink in their head and it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and it is, I agree completely with you that it is that cognitive dissonance of, and it's so hard, like um, you and I had talked about people with spiritual backgrounds, right? And it's like, oh, you know, he's, he's always serving in the church or helping the orphans or getting promoted at work or, you know, he's a fireman, he's a first responder, you know, he helps all these people. How can he also be the person that I'm seeing at home. Right. Yeah. Um, is, would, would that be how you would explain cognitive dissonance and that idea? Or would you, would you provide more in, in that piece of it? Yeah. Um, it's just, it's what I call um, fact versus fantasy. Okay. And, and so um, when those two things clash, um, you know, she has this image or her experience uh, of him, or maybe the story he's told her up into this point. And then at some point, as we call it, when the mass slips, there's new information that's introduced, um, fact versus I think I may have lost her for a second. Uh, since we're still recording, I'll, I'll go because she's talking about fact versus fiction, right? And then um, talking of uh, fantasy, I think she said, and thinking about that phrase, people who fall, you know, you can't fall in love with potential, right? You never want to fall oh, in love oh, with potential. Oh, I, okay. I lost so you're back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was saying to them, because it was still recording on my end, that it's like that phrase where you can't fall in love with potential. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So cognitive dissonance, you know, begins when the mass slips. Yeah. And there's, there's new information that's introduced. And it is a con, it's, you know, it's a internal conflict about trying to get on the same page and hold two different um, facts mm -hmm. at, the same time and then make um, a decision based on that. Mm -hmm. The issue though in, in cognitive dissonance is that dissonance has been studied as a social science theory for in short term issues. Like when you have a conflict, when you're trying to quit smoking, mm -hmm. um, but it has never been studied until we began to study it about in a chronic long-term scenario, what holding those dissonant views for decades mm -hmm. um, does emotionally, psychologically, and even neurologically mm -hmm. um, to the women. So they have they they have been you know exposed to this chronic and pervasive long-term dissidence, and we had no you know, understanding or information of, about what that does, because it's and never been studied like that. Is when people refer to saying they would have complex PTSD, does that align with that long-term cognitive dissonance or is that something else? Um, a, lot, a lot of times it's something else. I, I think what we have learned about um, this type of trauma is that it's a double whammy that 75% of the survivors come out with PTSD or complex PTSD, but 100% of them 
come out with cognitive dissonance. Okay, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. It, it's the number one symptom for pathological relationships. So if you don't have dissonance, you know, um, you might have had, you know, a traumatizing kind of relationship, but it's not what we would call, you know, a pathological love relationship. So part of that is that these survivors come out with this symptom of dissonance that has been misunderstood, misdiagnosed, misread. I think that's contributed, you know, to their problems of getting the right, the right kind of help. But um, all of them will have some level of dissonance because it makes sense that when you're in a relationship with Jekyll and Hyde, um, it already creates that dynamic of the split that you have to have skill sets for dealing with Jekyll and you have to have a different skill set for dealing with Hyde. And already those two different skill sets are dissonant yeah, from each absolutely. other. Yeah, from each other. So they might have, uh, they will have dissonance. They may or may not, you know, have complex PTSD. But the issue is from our studies is that that PTSD affects the executive functioning part of the brain. That, the memory and concentration and organization and sleep, all of that. Um, but when we studied that chronic ongoing dissonance, it, it also affected the um, executive functioning part of the brain. So they're getting a double whammy. So when they say, you. my God, why doesn't my brain work? I used to be a CPA and now I can't balance my checkbook. I can't work, I, you know. So we were really interested in that big cognitive and neuro impact um, because it just was way more even than when I ran a trauma clinic years ago. So I had people with PTSD complex, all of that. And these survivors, um, neuro, was so much worse than just regular PTSD. So we went digging to see why, and it's because they're get, their executive functioning is getting hit twice, both from trauma and then again from this chronic um, cognitive dissonance that's hitting the same part of the brain. And it's why treatment, it's why um, recovery takes so long with them. Cause you know, I'm sure your clients have said, my God, why does this take so long? And, um, and that's, a big piece of it is because it's very neuro. Well, I've heard a phrase and it said um, that being in a toxic relationship, it was like being in a concentration camp, but sleeping with Hitler. And that seems so extreme unless you've been in it. And then it's like, oh no, that, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Like, it's like these games, you never know what the day is going to provide. You keep hoping and trying to keep hope alive and then you're smacked down and then you're expected to sleep with Hitler. I mean, it, it's, it's complicated. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. Understatement. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's why we've talked about it not being um, very different than cult programming. I, I yes, I agree. Completely. And, in a lot of ways, this, the same kinds of things happen, mm -hmm. you know, at Waco or. Absolutely. Um, uh, Warren Jeffs, all of that, where, yeah, where the gaslighting and then you're in an intimate relationship with somebody uh, who is gaslighting and coercion and all of that. So not real different from that. In fact, I did, I, I used some of that information from the cult programming to put in the um, psychopath book because of that, because it is similar. I studied um, cults way more than pe uh, normal people would have thought. So uh, from that, for those very reasons, because when you start to get into and brainwashing, you know, is not necessarily a technical term, you know, you can't really be brainwashed, but this is what we think of in brainwashing, right? Like the cognitive dissonance, trusting someone mm -hmm. else, yeah. trust themselves. Um, right. So that, that cult hold um, 
I agree completely and that I have mm -hmm. aligned with what I have studied as well, for sure. So if someone is in the process of cognit cognitive dissonance, um, and when I was talking to a client this morning about cognitive dissonance, uh, we talked about there being like those Venn diagrams and there being like a blue circle and a red circle and making a purple circle. Like, you know, mm -hmm. how do we get our brains to, to change the color of what we see happening to us. Um, what are some tips uh, or help strategies that you have seen within that or that you would help someone with within trying to um, overcome cognitive dissonance? Um, well, that's the million dollar question because there's never sure. been any research done on it. So if, if you Google like the short-term version of cognitive dissonance, um, there, there is a little bit of discussion about dissonance reduction. But again, that has to do with somebody who's had dissonance, you know, for a few weeks, not somebody who has had it for years. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we don't have all of those answers yet. Mm -hmm. Even for someone who only had dissonance for a few weeks, there is so little information on how to reduce dissonance. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing because it's the number one social um, psychology theory, the most talked about theory mm -hmm. with the least information about reduction. And that's for short term. There's zero um, information for these types of survivors who have had it years and sometimes decades. And, and so when we say three steps to, you know, I see that. I knew better than that. I knew better than that to ask that. Three but steps yes. to dissonance <laughs> reduction out there. Um, yeah. I, I think they're not understanding that this is a really big neuro impact and that um, working with the, the cognitive part is after the neurostabilization. And so, um, We've seen it a lot, you know, when when uh, survivors come in and they can't retain anything. We can't work. Um, their neuro condition needs to get um, in a better condition in order, you know, to take in even the information about what dissidence is. And so um, sometimes that work with dissidents is, you know, after trauma treatment, after neurostabilization, it's for, it's further down the road, which is frustrating because it's the number one thing they beg, you know, for um, symptom relief from. It is so disturbing to them, but it is very much um, has to be and is reliant on um, trauma reduction and neurostabilization before you can do it. Mm -hmm. So this, so that's sort of the long-term answer for it. The one thing we do know, and, and a lot of this has to do with their super traits or their own personality, um, is that any time their walk and talk don't match because of their super trait, um, this one trait elevation called conscientiousness um, makes people who have higher than normal levels of conscientiousness are more prone to dissonance. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the one thing, you know, that some of the dissonance um, researchers have found that in a personality test or assessment, the higher the, the person rated on conscientiousness, the more prone they were, you know, to um, uh, dissonance. And so we did, you know, those kinds of testing on the women and they were well over the bell curve, you know, on in conscientiousness, which already tells us um, that's another reason why they have um, such profound dissonance is their personality is wired for that. And when their walk and talk don't match, when they believe um, abuse is wrong, you know, uh, infidelity is wrong, but they're stuck 
and their behavior can't line up with their belief systems, um, their, their dissonance goes up. And so um, obviously they already have a level of dissonance that they believe infidelity is wrong, but they're frozen and paralyzed in the, their ability to move. So they already have some dissonance. Then they begin to judge themselves for not being able to move and they might not understand it, you know, as dissonance, which is a, actually a cognitive paralyzation where they can't make decisions mm -hmm. um, based on the neuro condition. Um, and then, you know, their dissonance keeps, keeps going up from there and they're very prone to a debilitating level of dissonance. So I wanna get into the super traits and uh, you call them super traits. You know, my listeners are used to me hearing saying your best pieces were used against you. Uh, because when we think about my children, you know, do I want them to be conscientious? Yeah. Do I want them to be agreeable? Yeah. Do I want them to, you know, believe the best in people to some extent? You know, there are limits to that as you and I have discussed, but yes. And so, so often you see these people who are good, kind, loving, giving, and forgiving. And then they're end up in, in the worst relationships. And then when they try to get help or they tell people what's been going on, they get words like broken. They get words like codependent. They get words like, well, it must have been a bad childhood. Well, they get words like, you know, abandonment issues or something wrong with you. And it's, you right. know, there's actually a lot right with you that's being used to the toxic person's advantage rather than your own. So tell us about those super traits. Um, so 30 years ago, I started, you know, keeping information just sort of like um, notes to myself mm -hmm. about this consistent presentation in survivors. Um, not all survivors, but survivors who had been in these clusters. Huh? 63% did you say? Did you feel like we're not codependent, but we're, um, I thought you said 63% was about what the, you said not all, some, and I was trying to gauge about 63%. Yes, right. So I begin to notice these traits in survivors, not all survivors, but the survivors um, who had been in these cluster B relationships, because I had other survivor, you know, that I was treating that were not in cluster B relationships. Mm -hmm. But seeing these repeating traits in survivors of cluster Bs and psychopaths. And so um, in the first uh, psychopath book, we're on the third edition now, in the first one, um, we did a little um, assessment yeah, that, that's, the right <laughs> that's, that's the third one. I'm glad one. I read the right version. <laughs> um, so we, we did some personality assessment, you know, in the first one, and it, it gave us a clue to these two trait elevations, but it was a small group of women, 75 women, and it, it wasn't done through university and stuff like that. Okay. But it gave me enough to begin... Um, to continue to um, personality test to, to try to see if this really was a thing. Um, and then in, two, uh, in 2014, we hooked up with Purdue University and did a huge study over 600 women. Um, and it was the exact same outcome as that little 75 person, same thing. Um, and actually we used a couple different tools, you know, with Purdue. And so, um, you know, we began looking because that was the assumptions that people would make about these women, therapists or survivors themselves or their families or coaches. Um, the only word they knew was, you know, codependency right. about, you know, what, how to describe someone with a lot of empathy and a lot of tolerance and a lot of trust. And so they slapped, you know, codependency on, um, which is not, you know, a clinical diagnosis. It came from a survivor, <laughs> you know, a, 
um, Melody Beatty, you know, a million years ago. And so there was no other language to use for that. And, um, and so anyway, that's why um, we did the testing and 63, I think it was, 63% of the survivors did not test as codependent. They had these personality trait elevations um, in this, this uh, uh, trait, uh, what's called agreeableness. And, and that's responsible for trust, um, cooperation, empathy, loyalty, tolerance, being very straightforward that they overtell their <laughs> their information sort of in an over taking notes on what you're saying to bring them back up because yes i yes yeah, keep going. you're doing great <laughs> right um humble and, and so this issue of um codependency when it's really codependency it's rooted in aversive childhoods or addictive you know addictive parents or neglect or whatever um, but some 63% of these women did not have aversive childhood. So it couldn't be that. And, and so the, the, the personality trait of, for instance, cooperation right. is not the same thing as codependency when the roots of that aren't where they're supposed to be. So for the women who didn't have aversive childhoods and yet were very cooperative, that looked like codependency, it was being generated, you know, out of the personality, not out of their history. And we have a very bad um, tendency, especially with this population, um, because there hasn't been any tool to use right. in order to differentiate that because how you would help someone whether it's treatment or whether it's coaching someone with this history and someone with this personality is completely different but all we've done is this history it's all been focused on a history that 63 percent of the women did not have that's crazy and so they all kept dropping out so we did this this other study called Finding Competent Care and asked them why they were having such problems in, um, in recovery and sort of buckling down. And it was because everyone thought that if they ended up with someone like a psychopath, they had to have been abused as a child and that they all went there and they all stayed there. And the women kept saying, I, but I didn't have that. Oh, you just repress those memories. Oh, you just don't remember. <laughs> oh, that's that's so sad. I mean, it, it is so sad. The cognitive dissonance of I can't trust the per the person I love, and then I can't trust the person I'm trying to get help from. Right. That's right. Well, I mean, you know, I, I until probably the last I want to say seven eight years. It, there was a huge fail rate in treatment until um, we started bringing out a lot of this information so that therapists knew not to assume codependency that there is actually, you know, you need to be differentiating that because treatment, you know, is hinged on, on that. And so, um, so yes, there, there was a lot of assumptions about trauma histories and codependency. Um, relationship addicts, the women were assumed to be relationship addicts, <laughs> even if they only had, they'd been married 30 years to the same guy. They, we just, the field did not know what to do because, you know, all of, all of this wasn't out there yet. Yeah. So, um, so I think we're just now starting to get caught up where we have some working knowledge um, to bring to um, the, this type of survivor's treatment that's, you know, more effective than what we have been doing in the past. And I want to just recap some of the words she's used. Okay. So empathy, agreeableness, tolerance, trust, cooperation, loyalty, humility. As we raise children, if you 
created a child and they, they are empathetic, tolerant, trusting, cooperative, loyal, humble, people are going to tell you you're an amazing parent. And yet those are the same traits that are toxic people are targeting and that are keeping people in this cognitive dissonance. I just want to really point out, you know, that you're not necessarily broken. You're not a horrible person because you were in a toxic relationship. Um, and, and we need to do better in the future, right? <laughs> it's, as we talk about cognitive dissonance, it's both and, right? Like one well, of the they, that the, the issue is it's one thing when you're teaching, you know, children um, about those issues like empathy mm -hmm. and they might on a personality continuum, they might be sort of in the normal bell curve range. Um, we are not saying that these women are broken. I call these traits they're, su they're super- no, You're definitely not saying they're broken and I admire you for right. that. Just yes, that it, it, yeah. but, but <laughs> they are over the bell curve of safety. And that's exactly why this group of personality disorders, the antagonistic group targets people who do have more tolerance because who would tolerate them? Um, and, and so it's like having diabetes or anything else. Um, in order to work on something, you have to know that it exists. And the reason that these can I, women- Can I pause that? Because I want like, wow, do you hear what she's saying? You have to recognize something to be able to protect yourself from something. Uh, Absolutely. She says you can't, and I'm pulling up my notes, you can't protect yourself against what you cannot see. Right. And, uh, Sorry to interrupt. I was just like, that's a, that was such a big point in your in your book, um, and I want yeah. To and and the, the the survivors who have gone on to have more than one pathological, you know, relationship is um, usually because they they have not learned mm -hmm. about their super traits and what too much empathy, tolerance, trust um, can do when it's not reined in. Yeah. And, the, th yeah. and the, di the difficulty about, about personality is that yeah. we've, always, we've always had it, you know, yeah. since we were born. And so that feels normal. And the survivors will say, well, what do you mean too much empathy? What would it be like to have less empathy? They don't have a reference point mm -hmm. for, which is why it, begins to appear like boundary issues. And you know, lots of people say, you have to work on your boundaries. And, but what we're really talking about is this personality trait levels that they have always lived with and don't know what it would feel like to have less, more moderated empathy. And so our advanced treatment after trauma and neuro and dissidents, the, what we call the advanced steps in work is about working with those, those personality traits that are elevated, about learning how to rein those in mm -hmm. um, because your personality goes with you. They're always gonna have out of range, empathy, trust, all of that. They're always gonna have, which we didn't talk about the other per personality trait, conscientiousness. They're always gonna have um, that trait that's elevated. And unless they know what that sounds like in their head, and when it, we call it chaperoning, and when they're not chaperoning what that impulse is to help someone or, or be a resource to someone, um, then when, when it's outside of awareness, then they don't have a tool for that. They have no way of intervening <clears throat> on targeting. Um, you know, when those types of personalities look for this type of personality. And, and so I 100%, 100% believe that all the prevention work for future, you know, avoiding future um, relation, pathological relationships is this issue about super traits that you can't guard something you're not aware of mm -hmm. and what it acts like. 
and what it thinks like and and what it does and it, it it's like having to have the ultimate and like mindfulness um, when we go to work on this. And in fact, I have a, a, an advanced group that I've been working with now for two years. And mind you, our first step treatment, the Living Recovery Program, is only one year. Mm -hmm. And we do all the trauma reduction and work, you know, understanding about cognitive dissonance and then the real work as far as I'm concerned, is the second step, which is the prevention work and really coming to understand that those personality proclivities, because we all, you know, it, we can bring our mindfulness and our awareness to it, um, but that's about all we can do because we're not gonna change our personality, they're hardwired. So the only thing we can do is to become very alert to um, that we're a little bit over, you know, the, the bell curve of safety and we are what they seek. And I want to wrap up what she said and like point out some things, okay? Because so many women think that the way to protect themselves in the future is to create almost like an obsessive study of toxic behaviors. And it is important to understand toxic behaviors and manipulation and gaslighting. That is important. Everyone agrees that that's important. And what I want you to hear her saying is the real, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sandra, if I, if I mess this up, but I'm recapping because it was so important and I just want to make sure they get it. Um, studying toxic behaviors is important and studying how your kindness is used against you, your agreeableness is used against you, your mm -hmm. high levels of empathy are used against you and developing you know, what you referred to in your book as emotional defense strategies to prevent falling in those relationships again. And the mm -hmm. way I say it in my own work is learning how to um, realign with your integrity and because that's usually a word that resonates with women, they're like, okay, yeah, I want to be in alignment with my integrity. Well, being in, go ahead. And, and that they're talking about conscientiousness. Yes. That other trait, that integrity is actually conscientiousness and walk and talk should match. So yes. that's good. Yes. Yeah. So it, within that walk and talk matching, um, learning how really not to let your kindness be used against you. And that's the simplest way I know how to say it um, because these are, these are not bad qualities, but I hear you and I agree they're over the bell curve where they become unsafe. Too much of any good thing. Fire is right. amazing when it cooks our food and fire is dangerous when it ravages our houses. Water is amazing right. when we need a drink and water is, can also flood and kill us. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, well, it, we, so we don't tend to pay a lot of attention to personality, for instance, unless we have some debilitating like introversion or something we just come into the world with our personality and we think most people are wired like we are and they're you know in the last maybe two decades that the study on personality has really kind of um taken off where we're finally getting some some better understanding of how personality works um and that, that's really all we're saying is we all have a personality and some people have other types of risks in their personalities um, and, and other people have these, these super traits. We all have something. It's well, not a perfect personality. <laughs> right. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about in reference to personalities is in our last call, you said it's a shame that we call them um, uh, personality defects because they used to be called character defects or deficiencies. And uh, I, I went back and read Right that when before. you use that word, the women get it. Yes. <laughs> Got it. What do you mean by personality disorder? Yeah, but when you say character disorder, enough said. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm really sad that that I, you know, the DSM got away from that. Um, yeah, because I, I think that's much clearer, you know, yeah. for people. Well, and you've worked with George Simon, right? 
Mm-hmm. Worked with him quite a bit. I, I read his book, Character Deficiencies and Wolf in Sheep's Clothing in, in preparation for, for our meeting with you. Um, and it, it's not, he talked about it not being politically correct. Yeah. <laughs> way to say someone has poor yeah. character. And so when we operate from the belief system, um, and I think you, that everyone, you, this is the way you said it, Sandra, everyone will grow into their full potential if given enough time or the right resources, right? You, you did not believe that, but you said that was the danger. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. You talked about that being the danger. There was a, 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 a woman in your book that you, you know, she wasn't yeah. stupid, but she, right. Yes. But that, and that's, that's the, you know, the influence from positive psychology, which is a huge field, Yes. which, you know, most people believe some aspect of that. And, you know, my God, we have Oprah who loves positive psychology um, and psychopathology, you know, which is these character and personality disturbances. Um nobody likes it's like bad news it's depressing it's not rah rah you know everybody can change like oprah uh tells us and and we are very much influenced by the positive psychology um everybody not just people who work for sure for sure yeah and i call it Mm oprahology that we have taken our understanding of, you know, uh, psychology from Oprah. And, um, and that is the problem is because we do, you know, tend to come in with this belief system that everyone can change. And, you know, part of that super trait of that agreeableness trait it is, you know, one of the um, aspects of that is optimism about human behavior. Mm-hmm. So these women already come wired, you know, come wired for that. Um, And they are very relationship invested. They get their joy um, from deep and abiding relationships. And so they're much more, um, you know, invested in um, relationships and that that optimism about human nature and the belief that um, all people can change. And that's where... Um, this group, you know, has gotten uh, harmed. Oh my gosh. And, and in the, the uh, women who love psychopaths book, you used a phrase and you said um, that, can you really love someone enough that they change their eye color? Right. And it was like, yeah, that's really what we're saying. Yeah. Yes. Lo- love his blue eyes brown. Yes. Yeah. Can you yes. do that? Because that's really what we're talking about. And and there's been such a poor, very poor um, in this country, public pathology education. That's because we're so positive psychology oriented that we don't teach people that that the, the, the bad news of psychopathology is that there are disorders that don't, um, change or the change is so minuscule they can be in treatment the rest of their life and it's very minuscule um we we teach right now we don't have a cure for aids Mm -hmm. but we don't teach you know that about psychopathology and that's why you know i wrote how to spot a dangerous man because Mm -hmm. um all of the the types that were listed in there had some connection to permanent pathology. Right. And, you know, um, maybe in the last five years where narcissism is on, you know, everybody's lips and the president helped us understand that, um, it is that if you stop someone on the street, now they could probably name three or four traits of narcissism. Mm-hmm. Before that, uh, they couldn't. Um, and the same thing, you know, with true psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, most people, um, you know, can't tell you anything about it. And we're not, you know, working towards public pathology education that should be happening in middle school, 
you know, so people, kids do learn how to spot that and do understand. Well, I did create one and it's being used in high school. So I will point out that I, I um, there was a school in my area and a cheerleader was shot in her bed by a football player. And there was mm. a huge, um, you know, public outcry, but it gave me the opening that I wanted to be able to teach about toxic relationships in schools and healthy relationship dynamics. And, you know, and I didn't say people, those people will never change in the, in the setting that it was, but it was, Hey, did they make you feel smaller? Do you feel like you're talking to a parent rather than a partner? You know, some different things on a high, on a teenage level that can help them understand. And at least their friends understand whoa, yes. something's really wrong here, you know, because uh, you can't right. what it was say you can't, you can't fix what you can't see. Um, but I want to be very clear that the women with the cognitive dissonance, the women with the loopholes and uh, any experts that I get a chance to talk to, why would you say that you know that they cannot change or that they won't change or that the change will be so limited? I, I had a coaching call this week and there was a girl and she goes, well, I can't get my guy to do something that I wanted. And I said, how long have you been trying to get your guy to do something that you wanted? And it was about her kids. It's horrible. It's a horrible situation. You know, she's just saying, I want to protect my kids. I said, how long has it been since you've been trying to get him to do what you wanted? She said, 22 years. I said, so you've not been successful at this in 22 years. And you're, yeah, you're trying to solve the same problem. Do you, do, let's work around the problem. Let's figure out a different solution. And we, we could, you know, um, but <laughs> but it's 22 years of banging our head against the, against the wall. So um, to that woman who is in cognitive dissonance mode, or, you know, when I, when I say the phrase, you're trying to change his eye color through love or being so amazing that you can change his eye color. Um, what, what else would you give into that from your study of working with these men and brain? Uh, that, and brain that, and that the thing that we deal with um, our clients, either, in the living recovery program or the retreats or you know whatever is we immediately teach them the neuroscience of personality disorders mm -hmm. it's a done deal mm -hmm. there are mris of the of the brain there are databases of what the brain looks like with people who have narcissism antisocial psychopathy even borderline Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's, you know, the database of normal brains, and it is a very structural and neuro issue. Mm -hmm. um, there are, well, it's in the book, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. So there are six or seven parts of the brain region um, that that are affected by that, and it's important issues like. Um, impulse control when, when someone when one of the partners can't stop cheating or can't stop drugging or can't stop stealing or lying there is a part of the brain that's impaired uh, mm -hmm. that has to do with that impulse control there's also an impairment in the brain where um, in a section of the brain that normally teaches you um, how to learn from experience yeah. Uh -huh. So when that part is not functioning, no matter how many times she kicks them out for cheating or whatever it's doing, that part of the brain, um, you know, isn't working the way it is. To me, this is the whole issue of dangerousness and why we have gone to um, like the DV field, the domestic violence field and said, you need to differentiate this because the, the, the people that have pathological disorders have neuro issues, mm -hmm. that, that their lethality, their violence levels, then go from zero to rage in a nanosecond and that mechanism that usually catches people's behavior doesn't work. That's very different than a situational abuser who had a meltdown, he lost his job, he got angry, drank, he had a meltdown, he hurt her one time. This, we are talking Absolutely. about OJ Simpson versus your little guy that works at the corner store. Mm -hmm. um, and that um, that's what we really try to focus on because the biggest aha moment the women get when they read the book or 
any of our products or services is always that neuroscience. And it, it's like, uh, you're not going to do brain surgery. Did what? Six or seven different parts of the brain that doesn't work. So um, I, the, the best thing we can ever do, whether you're a friend trying to help a friend or you're a therapist or a coach is to teach the friggin' neuroscience. Mm -hmm. it, it is where the truth and the power are mm -hmm. in this um, be, because that's where the danger lies. And people tend to get it, you know, about, um, about the neuroscience of it. Every once in a while, you will get a survivor that says, can't you do brain surgery? You know, um, yeah. but for know. the most part, um, that really helps understand um, personality as hard, as hardwiring and, and that, you know, whatever treatment, I ran a personality disorder clinic, right. you know, those people were in treatment with me for years and their change is measured in millimeters while their damage to others is measured in miles. And is that really what you want? You want a millimeter of change in 22 years? Um, right. I so, absolutely believe you. I mean, I, I, I believe you. It, I almost hate to ask you this question because I already feel like I have a good grasp on the answer, but I know our listeners are asking this question. Um, what percentage nature and what percentage nurture? Because I think I want, if you could answer that, and then I want you to address the question. Um, but if he had brain cancer, I wouldn't just, you know, ignore him then. And if he had a bad childhood, he needs help. Cause I know that's the loophole, right? That, that women go to at that point, which is like, but if he had cancer, I wouldn't just leave him. So if this is what's the matter with his brain, then the right thing to do, conscientiousness, the right thing to do is stick him out and love him through that. Can you, can I, I know that's what's going on in women's head. Can you, can you address that? Even right. though I hate to ask, cause I know it's like, ah. <laughs> Right. Um, so nature versus nurture. Um, so there's a bunch of that in the book also. And so the issue of neuroscience and personality disorders and what we've come to know over the last couple of decades is so different than Freud's yes. understanding of a hundred years ago that we are now catching up to um, the nature part of it. We all knew the nurture, oh, they were abused as a child, oh, whatever. Um, but we didn't have you know, the, the understanding of the nurture part. Now um, we have the neuroscience about um, the neuro abnormalities and differences. And can, I be, can I jump in? We did not have brain scans a hundred years ago in the same way we have brain scans now. That's what, right. that's what she's talking about, right? Our yeah. science has caught right. up to the nature right. of conversation. Thank you. Sorry. And, I just and, that out. and you yeah. can, go, you can Google yeah. personality disorders and uh, MRI imaging, mm -hmm. and you can read the clinical articles on it. Um, but now we also have that we, um, in the nurture, I mean, nature um, part is there are now um, studies on heritability and genetics that it can be as high as 40 some percent of personality disorders. There is a genetic code connected to personality disorders. So having, which is why sometimes, um, you know, kids of personality disorder, it's not just learned. It's not just the environment that there's nurture. Um, I mean, nature, you know, aspects to that. And so when we say, is it nature or nurture? When, when they have a personality disorder and they have those neuro abnormalities, they're already there. Mm -hmm. So does their environment, can their environment do something? Yes, it can make it worse. 
That's so, a great explanation. Uh, so really I, yes. So I, how I teach therapists this, because a lot of them haven't worked in personality to understand this, is that our personality is the cake. Mm -hmm. It is the structure. It is the brain structure, it is brain circuitry, it's the organs, it's brain glucose, it's all of that, which is affected by personality disorders. Then our history is the icing. So the icing could be, you know, abuse or neglect or traumatic brain injury or whatever, but, but the cake is there. You don't put icing on nothing. Mm -hmm. The cake is already, the structure of our brain is already there. And then whatever happens adds or subtracts, you know, from that. And in most cases, of course, it has added. Mm -hmm. So if they have mentally ill parents or um, pathological parents or addicts or violence or whatever that they have experienced, um, that of course enhances the emotional regulation problems in the brain that they already have a problem with. It just layer it on. So going to therapy, you know, to resolve your early childhood when you are your cake is already baked, um, that's not going to change behavior. It will change maybe their awareness of why some of their behavior is like that, but it you're still going to have you, right? What? Yes, Which to use against, against, against you. you. For women, they're, oh, I'm going to get him a therapy, and then he goes to therapy, and then it's a, it's a, what I call the flip, right? He's able to flip it on you and be more confusing, so. Or, or just um, to get pity, you know, but yeah. you're not going to unbake that cake. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's our point. That's why we always start with neuroscience mm -hmm. when we're working with these clients. Mm -hmm. You know, we get the no contact and all that stuff done. And then our next thing is we're on neuroscience. So we stop all this. We're going to change and we're going to go to counseling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, step one in any recovery is acceptance and that we are powerless over someone else's pathology. We didn't create it. We can't heal it. All we can do is guard our children and our own health from it. But we have to take that you know, step of acceptance with that. And it's easier when you understand um, the neuroscience sure. um, and that there's genetics, inheritability and neuro that's all part of this and it's why it is considered um uh, you know a pervasive or um, the psychopathology of the dsm which are the parts that can't change and another thing that helps survivors to sort of put this in perspective is that in the DSM, there are two disorders mm -hmm. that are um, connected to what is called pervasive disorders. Mm -hmm. And per the word pervasive yes. in the DSM yes. means it is spread throughout. It affects everything you know, in a person. And the two areas that are considered lifelong is personality disorders because of heritability, genetics, the neuro parts of it. The other one is developmental disorders, mm -hmm. autism, intellectual disability. We understand that as when you say, we don't expect an autistic person to be different. Maybe they can do some behavioral things that are better and they can learn to get a job and whatever. But we never expect it to go to therapy for two years and that they're not going to be autistic or have Asperger's or have a higher IQ. But personality disorders and um, developmental disorders are the only two pervasive categories in the DSM. 
And that should give them a big clue. And, and I want to say, if you said, I want to be so amazing and lovable and wonderful and understanding and empathetic and patient that I can, you know, I, ha I have a, I have a cousin who's got special needs, right? You know, a, a cousin with special needs. If I thought, man, her mom is really not a good enough mom, that she wasn't loving enough, that her child's brain structure changed, people would look at me like I was crazy. Right. If, if I said, oh, I'm married to someone who's autistic and I, I just want to be so amazing and so sexy and so whatever, that he will no longer be autistic, people will look at you like you were crazy. Yet. Right. I want to and that's looking. really what we're talking that, yes. that's what we're talking about right. when we're talking about pervasive disorders. So those two areas about nurture and yeah. all of that and and pervasiveness mm -hmm. is the is the answer to survivors. Will that take a while to soak in? Absolutely, because the first thing that's going to happen is dissonance comes up and you're going to fight that you know, demon again. And it's, you know, there are cycles of dissidents that, you know, continue to roll through. But it, it's like, you know, once you see something, you can't unsee it. Yes. And once they hear the neuroscience, the nurture or nature issues, um, and the and the issue about pervasiveness, it's, it's in there. Mm -hmm. And they will begin to see his behaviors, in situations with that in mind. Mm -hmm. And um, and they, they really need to read something that is, that gives them that kind of information, um, you know, a, about why these are called pathological relationships. And that's because the partner has a pathology that's always gonna be there. The cake is and, not going to be rebaked. Yeah, I, no, I love that. You and there's nothing, there's nothing more dangerous than people who can't change. And so when I was running the personality disorder clinic, which I now call a babysitting service, um, you know, the, the whole issue about, about human growth is that we have to be able to have, you know, insight into how our behavior hurts others, you know, inability to grow and change. Um, that's what counseling is all about, mm -hmm. is that you gather insight and then you grow and change. These people are constitutionally, by their own neurology um, and their own uh, nurture genetics, incapable of that. That's really what pathology is, an inability to sustain non-manipulative, positive change. Ability to sustain. The inability. The, the inability to sustain non-manipulative. And I love, I love, I think George Simon used that too. I love that non-manipulative change because yeah, they can act like they are, they can tell you what you want to hear. Let's just be super clear. They can tell you what you want to hear. Then if you are in the process of cognitive dissonance anyway, right, and you want right. to latch on to what they are saying, it right. is a dangerous as you use game. It is a dangerous right. game. Yeah. And yeah, so so I call it the rubber band effect. So they go to therapy and they learn a couple of things like listen. Yeah. or give feedback. I mean, it's very mechanical. Yes. You yes. Know, and then they come back and they do that for two weeks and maybe they're less aggressive or argumentative. Um, but a personality disorder is the inability to sustain positive change. Mm -hmm. And so the behavior goes back. And then they blame the other person or something else is introduced that makes it confusing. And you, you just peel off the years, like you said, 22 years, um, waiting, you know, waiting for change. And the saddest thing is, I guess maybe it's sad, but it's also encouraging. I have had uh, women in our program at 80 that had, it's never too late you know, to, to, uh, to get healing. But on the other hand, you know, that, that's very sad 
um, th that your whole Curious life, you know, is wrapped up in that. My, my clients tend to be in their 50s and 60s as well. I mean, there's a few mm -hmm. earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, I would be curious as to why I have a kind of a theory of why I think that is. Um, is that kind of something you've seen, like much more of an older population dealing with this issue than a younger? And if so, it's not because there's not younger toxic people and there's younger toxic relationships. So uh, do you have any... I just think it, it, it's part of, of um, the developmental stage at those ages uh, of what women go through at that age. And um, first of all, they have more disposable income to be able to do those kinds of things. And then the, top, the clock is ticking. It's like, you know, um, and then, you know, then there's a hormonal aspect um, you know, once they are on, going through menopause or almost through menopause, your attitude about a lot of things change. It's like, screw this. Uh -huh. um, and yes, we do see um, a lot of people in their late 40s, 50s, and 60s. But yeah. Like well, I also think kids are a really lovely distraction from having, sorry, there's a motorcycle or something going by. Kids are a lovely distraction yeah, from that's right. thinking about your own life, right? Um, and 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 for anyone listening to this don't the the women i know who have been in their 50s and 60s i've not heard one of them say well i'm really just glad i waited so long to figure this out like no <laughs> one says that right especially right when they yeah. have kids in their mid-20s and right with your, their own kids have developed you know or in, in a way that they're not proud of or you know, it's so sad when. And a lot of the times it's when their kids get older and they recognize mm -hmm. the pathology in that person that they began to, you know, suggest to her to get help. A lot of times we yes. get yes. her and her adult children, you yes. know, who are yes. all on the same boat, you know, seeing what they see and understanding it differently. Which, yeah. I mean, honestly, the feeling that comes up for me is like, like, like almost like throwing up. Like, I mean, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, like I'm, I'm glad people are getting help then. And I want to say, can you imagine those of you who are younger, can you imagine your children looking you in the face and saying, mom, why did you not leave him earlier? Because I hear that story over and over mm -hmm. and over and right. over and it's heartbreaking. Yes. It's heartbreaking. It's your kid's whole childhood. It's your right. whole, you know, decades of your life. Um, right. And, you know, I, my little saying that my girlfriend uh, gave me years ago, the best time to see the light is as soon as you can. Oh, so, okay. Uh -huh. So, you know, when there's a, a, a little crack of light, um, see it, you know, when there's a crack of light in his behavior, um, in the relationship dynamics, in your trauma, whatever it is, oh. see it. Well, Sandra, uh, thank you so much. This was so fun. I know we talked before. I have just really enjoyed talking to you, uh, studying your work more. I love, love, love the super traits. Melissa actually sent it to me because she goes, this is what you're always saying. Your kindness used against you. And, um, and just being able to give women shorter bridges to cross and the right yes. bridge to cross. If it's not coming, yes. they don't try to cross that bridge and right. solve the problem exactly. that is not right. the whatever else it can be. So thank right. you so much. You are yeah. welcome. Definitely thank give you. her a Google, Sandra L. Brown, M.A. Give her a, a Google and buy her stuff. I'm um, reading the how to spot a dangerous man right now and uh and, and loving it loving it so thank you so much thank you for having me bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Mm -hmm.